Welcome to a new lecture, Explainable Machine Learning. And today is the first lecture in this series, which is about an introduction uh, about Explainable Machine Learning. I will tell you what it is and what you can do with it. My name is Ribana Rocha. I'm a professor of data science for crop systems. And as the name says, uh, throughout the lecture, I will tell a lot about plant sciences or remote sensing, but I guess they are really nice examples uh, which fit into the area of explainable machine learning. Okay, so let's get started with the, with the first lecture. And I want to start with typical questions we are concerned with in Earth observation data analysis. And you can see these questions here. You can uh, ask, for example, what is here, which is the classification task. Or you can ask what is the biomass in this area, which is a regression task. Or you can ask what would it look like next month, which is a forecasting task. But um, so all these questions have a, a different level of complexity and difficulty. But there are other kind of questions we can ask. We can also ask why does it look like this? Or we can ask how did my algorithm come to the conclusion that this is water? Or we can ask how does my algorithm perform poorly here? So first we had the what questions and these are all how and why questions. And for the rest of the talk I will exactly focus on these why and how questions because this is actually what we do in explainable machine learning. So first of all, let me summarize briefly what I mean with uh, explainable machine learning. And I want to mention here that there's uh, so far no really unique definition of explainable machine learning. So what I tell you within the next um, few slides or even the next lectures is my view on this topic. So when we approach uh, such a specific task here, like instance segmentation, we can use a deep neural network for this. That's a super good idea, mostly uh, it's very powerful approach. Um, but since such networks are quite complex, deep neural networks seem to be the prime example of a black box model. And to make deep neural networks more understandable and to answer these how and the why questions, uh, there are three core elements which need to be considered or we need to think about this. And these three core elements are transparency, interpretability and explainability. And I want to show you in the next few slides what is actually meant with it. So first of all, let's uh, talk about transparency. So transparency um, is so very often we talk about black box models and uh, but mostly we actually have transparent uh, models. So transparency or transparent model is the opposite of a black box model. But what does it actually mean? So transparency of a machine learning approach is concerned with different ingredients, such as the overall model structure or individual model components, such as specific parameters or the structure. Um, and it's concerned with the learning algorithm and how the specific solution is to, uh, obtained by the algorithm. You can even think about, um, or you can, it can even be concerned with the motivation why a specific algorithm was used by the user. And so when you look at this example here, you also see this equation here. And very often it's the case that we have access to the model, that we have access to the architecture, and even we have access to the complete equation, the complete mathematical relationship between the input and the output. So very often the problem is not the transparency. The problem is that the overall uh, model is so complex that it's really hard to understand, that we cannot really uh, grasp what's going on there. And so it's, uh, it's hard to understand um, or it's, it's barely understandable what's going on. And this is what interpretability is concerned with. Interpretability is about making sense of the obtained machine learning model with the aim to present some properties of the model in understandable terms to human. 
Um, this can be, for example, with feature statistics such as feature importance or with data points with special significance such as archetypes or prototypes. The prototypes are typical examples uh, of a data set, for example, the mean or the median, and archetypes are extreme points. And it, uh, we can also use, uh, for example, model parameters, so you can we can visualize model parameters or we can visualize patterns in the decision process. And uh, so you can, uh, you can already see that uh, there are a lot of possibilities uh, where we can uh, uh, have a look at. And I will cover all of them or many of them in the next uh, few lectures. And the most prominent example for visualization are heat maps. So uh, heat maps are very often used and uh, used as interpretation and uh, used to visualize what's going on in the network. And they can be, can for example, as an example here, indicate why are these images here identified as the same whale. So what you can see here is actually four images of whale flukes and um, a whale or a whale fluke is very specific uh, for a whale. So if you have certain patterns and um, you have another fluke with the same patterns, it's very, very, very likely that it's the same whale. So actually researchers and uh, also um, uh, uh, people in general uh, use the flukes to, uh, to yeah, to track the spatial temporal uh, migration of whales and just to see if it's the same way or not. But anyway, heat maps. Um, so you have these uh, four whales, uh, no, one whale, four images. And what you can see here are uh, these heat maps and you have um, in each of these image one hotspot, one, um, yeah, the, which is illustrated here in, in red, which indicates uh, what or uh, which location the algorithm thinks is important for the decision to identify exactly these four images as the same way. And so what is actually here is you, uh, in all these images you have a spot in the upper right corner. But uh, there's even more. Uh, there's explainability. And uh, Research into explainable and explainable machine learning is widely recognized as uh, important, which is good. Um, but there are a lot of terms which pop up within the last um, few years or even before. And it's also known as explainable AI, so XAI, intelligible intelligence, and so on. The problem is, um, so far there's no uh, joint understanding of the concept of explainability, so it still needs to evolve. But there's a lot of research going on. And so what exactly is explainability? Is, uh, it is when you combine these interpretable entities uh, with domain knowledge and in the best case an analysis goal. And if you were listen carefully uh, here, I always said, ah, okay, there's a, a hotspot, there's a specific uh, spot in um, in this image where uh, from which the uh, algorithm thinks or the method thinks it's important. But uh, uh, here, so far, no domain knowledge is integrated, so it's just an interpretation. But I will get back to this in a few slides. Um, so again, uh, let's have a closer look at interpretability and explainability and why it might be important to distinguish between these two. Um, so interpretability, again, is the, uh, when you present properties of a machine learning model in understandable terms to a human. And explainability is when you combine it with domain knowledge and in the best case an analysis goal. And for a large part of the literature, there's no clear distinction between interpretation and explanation, which is okay, but it can uh, be a problem in the sciences where domain knowledge plays a huge role and is really important uh, to, to have this. So the, the reason why we distinguish explainability and interpretability is that an explanation can change depending on the use case. That means the added domain knowledge. 
And it doesn't mean, or you cannot really say then it's uh, right or wrong. It's just that you integrate different kind of domain knowledge. And to come back to this example of these four whales, um, an interpretation would be the score for the whale ID X is significantly influenced by the image patterns uh, on the right upper corner of the image A, B or C. And the explanation for this would be the notch in the fluke of the whale uh, with ID uh, X is a relevant fluke pattern for identifying the specific whale. So you see, this is uh, about uh, pixels, locations, very general. And this is with uh, domain knowledge uh, from a whale expert or maybe also uh, just someone who knows a little bit about whales. And when you think about it more deeply, it appears that there's uh, another connection, uh, namely to correlation and causation. It's also very important to distinguish between correlation and causation. So please don't mix it up. Uh, so ca causation means that an output is the result of the occurrence of a specific input. So the input is the cause and the output is the effect. And uh, correlation measures uh, the relationship between the input and the output, but it doesn't mean that this implies a causation. And so to give you, to give you an example here, it rains. When it rains, uh, it causes that plants will grow and it causes also that I will use my umbrella. Um, and although there is a uh, obviously a correlation between plants and grow, uh, growing and I use my umbrella, it does not imply that plants grow when I use an umbrella. So this is only a correlation but not, and, but not a cause and effect. And this is actually uh, what is uh, modded very often in machine learning models, which is fine, we just uh, need to be aware of it. And when we connect this to uh, now to the area of explainable machine learning, we will realize that interpretation tools generally build on this correlation. Of course, because um, uh, correlation tools present properties of a machine learning model and, uh, this, and this machine learning model very often just uh, measures or models the, um, correla the correlation or the relationship between the input and the output which is very often a correlation. So one thing we really need to take care of is the confirmation bias. So this is uh, closely connected to this. And confirmation bias is the underlying ten tendency to search for explanation which are in line with our existing knowledge. So everybody has it. It also happened to me that I have a confirmation bias. So um, we, the, the, what is happening here is that we tend to explain something which we think we discovered, but it's actually not in the data or it's not in the model. So when we see a correlation and uh, or the, uh, an interpretation, we tend to explain this what we see with our existing knowledge, but sometimes it, it just happened that it's um, yeah, that is not really in the data or the explanation is uh, just wrong. And to give you an example, so we designed a quite obvious uh, toy example and this toy example models the so-called Clever Hans effect. I will tell you in a, in a few seconds what Clever Hans effect exactly is. But what you can see here is um, a toy example where an explanation uh, would be wrong because the model just captures the correlation but not, not really a cause and effect but in the end what we mostly actually want to have is, is the cause and effect or an actual uh, explanation of the cause. So what we did here is we trained a ResNet classifier, so a very powerful deep neural network for scene classification. So one scene is assigned to one label um, and we train it on various training samples and we have one set here which contains uh, aerial images, so uh, just uh, normal scenes. 
And um, we have uh, one set where we add a text uh, to which the images belong. So this can be seen here. Um, so here on the bottom in these images, we just added the text of the class in red obvious letters. And um, so this is obviously not an important feature because this text doesn't belong to the scene, but it's um, somehow in the data. Um, and the classifier does not know it. it the, the classifier does not know that this is not an important feature and this is actually nothing it should look at. But on the contrary, the classifier, when trained with the correct text, that means um, when we uh, put the label of the, or the correct label on the bottom of the image, it learns that this correlation is important for the scene classification. Of course, it's because it's an easy uh, feature. And this can be seen when you change a text to another class in the testing step, um, because then the image is uh, classified incorrectly quite often. And uh, this is a problem and it gets uh, even more clear when we have a look at the feature maps here. Um, so these are the feature maps right before the decision layer. And uh, these, what you can see here uh, is, uh, this indicates that the classifier is assigning high importance uh, and weight for the text instead of the objects. Re, um, which represents the class in the image, such as an airport or a school building. So high, uh, this bright red color indicates that the, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the classifier has there, or the model has their high activation, it's highly activated, so it's important. And um, yeah, you can here see the text school, and here, there you can see the text beach. And this is a prominent example for a so-called clever Hans effect. So clever Hans effect means that the classifier makes the right decision, but it's based on the wrong reason. And here, um, when you when you think about it, when you use such um, uh, such visualizations um, to uh, to explain what is uh, happening in the classifier, you might come to wrong explanations. So far we talked about the definition, and, uh, but um, I want to talk a little bit more why do we actually want to have explanation because they can be very diverse and uh, all are really important. And uh, so explainable machine learning can be applied for, yeah, for many reasons. And here's one important work actually there. Uh, it's a, a work um, from Adali and Berada from 2018 and they name four reasons why uh, uh, or to, four reasons to seek explanation so where uh, or why explanations would be helpful and the first one is to justify decisions and here you explain the, uh, the particular outcome rather than describing the inner workings of a machine learning model and this is especially important when, decision, when it is, uh, decision is unexpected. When it's un unexpected, you're surprised, or you, um, not only you, but also the user um, who needs the, uh, the results or maybe even the base decision on, on this result. So you need, um, to, you need to know why it actually happened. So you want to increase the trust in the result. And so if you know why the decision was made, you could justify it, for example, that uh, the result is fair and that it's reasonable. And this is something uh, which uh, where the demand grows more and more in the community, in different communities. And I think this is uh, especially, uh, there's especially a higher demand in the sciences where you want to have a scientific output put a scientific outcome um, and yeah you need you rely on this uh, to make decisions. Another uh, reason to seek explanations is to enhance control and here uh, explainability can help to prevent that things go wrong. So if we can understand uh, where the flaws are and how exactly uh, a machine learning, uh, machine learning model works 
uh, in the way we um, uh, which parts are responsible, for example, or for a specific um, feature weighing, something like this, we have a better control and we can even correct errors. So overall, it enables a fast reaction time. So if you can uh, have control over your model and you understand what's going on and then something uh, goes, goes wrong, uh, you can, you can uh, react very fast because you know where to look and maybe um, you can even know what to, uh, you can even uh, decide what to do. And this is uh, the third reason closely connected to the second one. A reason to seek explanation is also to improve models. So uh, here a better understanding of the inner workings. So re you really look into the inner workings uh, and the behavior of a model enables a targeted improvement. So for example, when you know uh, how, your machine learning, uh, how, your, uh, how your machine learning model works and you know in which case it will fail, uh, it is much easier to improve the model. I think we all have been uh, there that we, uh, we uh, program something, so we have a nice code and when we test something and it doesn't work. And uh, you always need to, th uh, need to think about is it because of my data or is it because uh, my model is wrong. And if you um, know how your model works and if you have uh, can look into the model, it's much easier to identify uh, if it's actually the model or if something is wrong with the data. And the good thing is that explainability can help with both of them. So you can, it can help you to collect better data or to improve the data or de-bias data, but it can also help you to, um, yeah, to improve your model and maybe just to um, yeah, improve the model structure in the neural network, something like this. And the last thing, which is also one of my research areas, uh, super interesting, is uh, you can use explainable machine learning to discover new knowledge. So here you uh, search for patterns in the decision process uh, and from this um, you can get new insights in the data uh, and they can, uh, or these, from these patterns and uh, from these new insights in the data, they can help us to, uh, to teach or they can teach us new things. So we get uh, novel insights, we learn new things and it's particularly interesting when the model performs better than a human because uh, then um, the, under uh, the un understanding the model in a better way can help us to improve and correct our previous knowledge. So it's not always that uh, we, the machine learning models, need to be completely aligned with our previous knowledge. This is uh, one uh, application, I would say, for machine learning model, this automation uh, where you yeah, want uh, the model to uh, be aligned with your knowledge. But this is interesting because sometimes you can learn from, um, yeah, from the model in a way that you analyze the decision process and maybe the decision process from the machine learning model is um, better than your personal decision process. Who knows? Um, but very interesting, um, uh, or the, a very a very good reason to use explainable machine learning. Okay, so when you think of how machine learning model could reveal insights into their decision process, you can categorize this by spec uh, specificity. <laughs> Difficult word. Um, so what you can see here uh, are two categories, actually. Uh, the first one here illustrated on the top is that you want to understand how the model relates the input to the output. And in this case, actually, you don't even need to care about the transparency uh, of, the, of the model. So the approach is um, model agnostic. This is when uh, you can use, uh, you can actually treat it as a black box, so you don't need to look into the model. Uh, you just only want to understand the mapping from the input to the output. That means what will happen to the output if you change the input a little bit. Or also not only a little bit, uh, a lot, but you want to understand if you uh, yeah, uh, change there what happens 
there. <laughs> okay, uh, the second one is uh, that you want to understand how specific parts of a network are responsible for a specific uh, decision. And here you can see uh, you actually really need to uh, want to look into the model. And so here um, you can find an interpretation through methods that were tailored to specific models. For example, you want to have a look into weights of a linear model. So uh, this is the good thing about such approaches is uh, because it's model agnostic, you, you uh, can use the same method, uh, the same tool for a lot of models. And this uh, is mostly very model specific. And also one thing, because I mentioned your post hoc, uh, post hoc means that it's not done during the learning optimization process, but it's done afterwards. So you have, uh, you take a, a trained model, it's there and even as a black box, and then you apply the, uh, use, or you apply, use the interpretation tool. And then there's uh, another um, way to categorize, and this is by locality. And uh, again, you have two categories here on the top and on the bottom, and you can explain, for example, uh, locally. Uh, that means uh, you explain one specific decision. This will give you insight about characteristic of one specific sample. So that can be really interesting, but it's, uh, yeah, you only look at one specific example. In, in this case, um, again, one image of a whale, and you want to know, for example, why this specific image was classified as a specific uh, whale ID. The second one is when you explain the whole model behavior. So the whole data set is involved. And this can be done, for example, by calculating a so-called prototype. Um, a prototype is a maybe synthetic, typical sample, which will lead to a maximum score. So um, a prototype is uh, when you, for example, uh, think about classification and um, a prototype will lead to a 100% score or a score of one for one specific class. So there's no doubt for the model that uh, this example will belong to any other class. Um, yeah, this helps uh, to understand when your model will perform really, really good. And it can also derive insight when it would fail. So for example, if you know how your prototype looks like, you might, and you want to have a more diverse data set, you can look uh, for a collection of samples which are not very similar to your prototype. And then there's another type of approach, which uh, I did not mention in this in the previous slide. Um, so I did not explicitly mention it, which is the interpretation of uh, the algorithm. And this is, uh, so how does uh, it, it analyze how a specific type of model come to res, uh, result? And here it's about a specific type like uh, convolutional neural networks. So convolutional neural networks learn um, first basic features in, um, yeah, in, in the first layers and in deeper layers, um, they uh, learn more complex features. So from edges in the first layers to uh, nearly objects and deeper layers. And here you uh, analyze the whole type, which is the uh, convolutional type uh, of neural networks. Okay, so before looking at specific interpretation methods, like uh, let's have a look at specific properties. Um, of such techniques and also uh, to the quality. This is, so this is, uh, I would uh, mention here or explain here four properties. And um, then I would talk, uh, this is about more about uh, the algorithm, uh, the interpretation method. And then I will mention a few more, um, yeah, quality, um, measures, so when, so how do you know when your interpretation is uh, good or helpful or something like this. Okay, so the first one is expressive power. 
Uh, here, it, this is the language of the extracted explanation. For example, you can extract if then rules, you can uh, use lect uh, <laughs> lectures, no, of course you can also use lectures, but this is um, <laughs> more about the natural language, so you tell something, uh, or you can use histograms, specific visualizations, something like this. And here it becomes really obvious that you need to think about what the user wants to have. So uh, what have an expressive power for you uh, does not necessarily mean uh, it's, uh, it's good for another person. So for example, when this person does not know what a histogram is, a histogram will not tell anything. It will not help. The second one is translucency. Uh, translucency describes the degree um, the method relies on looking into the model. So this is uh, when you really need to, uh, you need to have access uh, to the model. Um, for example, like its parameters or the, uh, the model architecture. And so, for example, uh, methods which are inherently interpretable, uh, like linear regression or decision trees, are highly translucent. And methods, they only rely on manipulating the input and then looking on how the output would change. They have zero translucency. So uh, these are exactly these model, model agnostic approaches. So you can treat the model as a black box, but you can still, uh, yeah, you still can get some insights into the decision process. But it depends on the scenario. Sometimes you want to uh, know something about what's going on in the inner workings and sometimes you just want to see how the decision process would change if you change something or how the overall decision process of the model behaves. And okay, so the, um, the third one is portability. So portability is uh, actually actually it's connected to the second one because uh, if you the, the advantage of this uh, of low translucency is that the method can be applied to many many other models and that means it has a high portability. So you can see uh, these uh, properties and its quality measures are uh, yeah you will see there there. Um, uh, they are overlapping sometimes and uh, yeah, they are just connected. So portability is the range of the methods the technique can be applied to or combined with. And uh, portability is, um, for example, a lot of methods you will see later are restricted con to convolutional neural networks, which is not necessarily bad. They were, they were just developed to analyze convolutional neural networks, but uh, you need to be aware that uh, if you change the model, uh, it sometimes can also mean that you need to change the interpretation method uh, to get new insights. And the last one is algorithmic complexity. And as the name says, this is the computational complexity to produce an explanation. And um, yeah, sometimes uh, that can be a huge bottleneck. Uh, so you're uh, interpretation tool it should not be more uh, more complex than uh, the learning of the model. I mean, it it can be, but uh, very often this is not a good sign for the interpretation tool. And then there are some properties which describe the quality of specific interpretations. So I will actually name nine of them. And as I said before, they are sometimes connected and, and very similar. But uh, I, I briefly want to mention them all. So the first one, ah, I forgot to mention, uh, these quality uh, measures are actually from this paper. And if you want to know more about it, more than I tell here, I uh, recommend to go to this paper. So uh, the first one is accuracy and accuracy is uh, the generalization ability of the interpretation to unseen examples. In other words, the, uh, the ability that an interpretation of a given decision generalized to other yet unseen instances. For, for example, if an interpretation is in the form of rules, 
do these rules actually apply also to the other instances? And the second one is fidelity. Uh, so for example, so fidelity is uh, first is the degree to which the interpretation reflects the behavior of the model. And so for example, if one considers the importance of a certain feature, uh, for some samples, the local fidelity expresses the extent to which the interpretation holds for all samples in the vicinity of those for which we created the interpretation. So this is the local fidelity, so you look only locally. And then you have the general fidelity, which concerns all the whole model. So the general fidelity is when we consider the global context of the model. Again, there's nothing bad or wrong if you have only, uh, uh, if you just look at the local fidelity. It's just that, that you need to be aware that uh, it's actually okay to, uh, to have a, let's say, uh, an interpretation tool which has a good local fidelity, but the general fid fidelity might be not so good. And then there's uh, consistency. Uh, consistency is the degree to which similar interpretations are generated from different models for the same task. So sometimes it can happen that uh, the predictions are quite similar for, uh, for different models, but uh, this might not hold for the interpretations. So then in case when this happens, so you have a similar behavior of the model, but different interpretations, then your consistency is not so high. So it's always worth to check if the interpretation tool has a high variance. Um, so this is, uh, I will also mention later again. Um, so, or not later, I will mention it again now, because uh, stability is also concerned with it. It's similar to consistency, but now um, we uh, do not look at different models, but uh, different, um, uh, so not different models, but different, get similar or even equal examples and the same model. And so some interpretation methods, as I said, just have a high variance. So they produce highly variable interpretation. It's good to have an interpretation tool uh, which is stable. And sometimes it can happen that even if you rerun the interpretation tool, um, that it will give you a different interpretation. Um, this happens when you have some random components in there. Or, yeah. Then there's compre uh, comprehensibility. This is the uh, readability and the size of the interpretation. So readability depends on the audience, again, uh, if you have experts or the general public. So for experts, it's mostly very uh, specific, very targeted, and for the general public, uh, you uh, mostly prefer easy interpretations, um, uh, interpretation which uh, contain nice visualizations. And uh, speaking of nice visualization, the size of the interpretation uh, refers, for example, to the number of rules or the complexity of the visualization. So how many dots, how many arrows, how many colors you have in there. Uh, the size refers to the number of words, the number of parameters in a linear model and so on. Um, so it's always good to have a, um, a low or a small size uh, of the interpretation because otherwise it might be uh, very complex and again you have the same problems you don't understand uh, the same problem you don't understand what's going on and then there's certainty uh, certainty is the ability to reflect the certainty of the the model um, so if a model is not really certain about the decision, it would be good uh, that this is reflected in the interpretation or the explanation should be considered with the uncertainty of the model. So this is uh, actually connected to a different research area of uncertainty quantification. Um, in the end, it would always, in the best case, uh, you have an outcome of a model uh, the accuracy, uh, so your result and accuracy, but then you have all, uh, also the uncertainty, uh, uncertainty, so how certain are you about the, the outcome? This is not 
This is not the same as accuracy, as the, uh, the uncertainty reflects, for example, the uncertainty of the data and the uncertainty in the overall uh, model. And then you can have explanations. So, and this combination is actually the best case. So then you have, um, yeah, you analyze the model in a very comprehensive way. And then the last three ones are uh, the degree of importance. So this is the ability to report the importance of the return item. And with item, I mean the interpreted feature or the returned rule. So, uh, for example, um, it can happen that standalone, it might, uh, this, this outcome might uh, misleading, but if you report, for example, for a rule, what was the most important condition, you get a better explanation. So it's not always necessary, um, but it can help a lot to uh, get a better understanding about your interpretation and then getting to a better explanation. The second one is novelty. Uh, this is the ability to indicate whether the explained instance is out of the training data distribution. And this is a general problem in machine learning. So these out of distribution samples. So the uh, model is very certain about um, a decision, but actually it ca it's not reliable what it predicted because it, uh, uh, it has never seen such uh, samples before. And the test sample uh, um, is just far away from the training samples. So um, here the point is that if the method is able to reflect in some way that the prediction is unreliable, because uh, the model was not trained on such sample, it can help a lot to get, um, uh, or it helps a lot to get trust in the result and trust in, um, in the decision. And then there's representativeness. Uh, this is the degree on um, how much of the model behavior is covered partly or uh, the whole model. And this is connected to fidelity. So representativeness indicates what the interpretation covers, uh, a single sample or the whole model. Um, again, uh, it's not uh, wrong or bad uh, if you just analyze a single sample. It's just you should not use an interpretation tool to analyze a single sample when you actually want to know something about the whole model. And because I work with scientific data, for me an interesting question is always, can explainable machine learning be useful in the sciences? And the answer is yes, of course. Um, not, not of course, but uh, yes, otherwise I would not stand here and tell you about it. Uh, so it can help to tackle typical challenges which occur with scientific data like remote sensing observation or invasive measurements in the lab or in the field, so whatever kind of scientific data you have. So what you can see here on the top is the typical machine learning pipeline. Again, you have the, the input data, then you have the model and you have the output results and the model, model's relationship between the input and the output. And in all areas of this um, machine learning pipeline, you have challenges. And I want to go through them and tell you where and how explainable machine learning can help you in this specific area. So the first challenge is that the data is complex. And explainable machine learning can help here, for example, to point you to relevant patterns or relevant features. And generally, since interpretation tools uh, visualize the data, and visualize these complex process, what's going on in a machine learning model, it helps also to understand your data with respect, uh, with respect to the model and the task you want to solve. Another challenge is that we need to handle a limited amount of training data. So this is very often what happens uh, with scientific data. So we do not have an image net. It would be nice, but mostly we don't. Um, so in general, we need experts to label our data and this is a super time consuming process. And the thing is uh, also you need the experts. So you can mostly not do it on your own. So the existing data should be uh, correct and informative. 
And here explainable machine learning uh, can help during the data collection process. So for example, by checking if the machine learning model makes the right decision based on the wrong reasons. If this is the case, so uh, in case you have data biases in your data set, you uh, can collect data in a way or remove data in a way that you get rid of these data biases or uh, it can help you uh, to see where you need more training data to train a better model. And then the third challenge is that as soon as we use complex models uh, such as neural networks, it's hard uh, to understand uh, what's going on. So you have this black box behavior. And so many of these pre-trained uh, networks um, are made for RGB images or point clouds with man-made objects or these typical uh, yeah, image net like data. And very often it happens that these networks are not, uh, these pre-trained networks are not useful for scientific data. It's just not, cannot be applied right away. So we need to train them from scratch and training from scratch is a super tedious process. It's super time consuming. So if we understand the models in a better way, so if we have uh, tools to understand or to see in a better way what is going on, it's easier to train them. So for example, if we would know when our network fails, uh, we can think about how we can fix it. So uh, it's, it's similar to when you use uh, just uh, a toolbox in a, in a software and you just click on a button, you don't know what's going on. Uh, so, and if something goes wrong, it's just not clear why. And, but if you uh, coded the algorithm on your own, you, you see what's going on, you know what is happening. Um, and the last challenge is that you want to have scientific results. And so when you look at the output results, an important point is that it does not necessarily mean that it's useful from a scientific point of view. So what does it actually mean to have a scientific result? So first, uh, it's actually two points uh, I see here. First, you want to have the result to be explainable and reliable. So you want to have, uh, you want yourself and others to trust in the result. And you want to have uh, to be um, uh, you want to have a scientifically consistent result. This is actually um, a different research area closely connected to explainable machine learning. It's called informed machine learning, theory guided machine learning, physics informed machine learning. There are a lot of terms. And here you ensure that uh, when you get an output, it actually makes sense and uh, also is in line with, for example, phys uh, physical laws and, and so on. But I actually want to talk about the first point here. And before I come to the, uh, the first part where we have at uh, a look at specific methods, I want to mention that there are a lot of terms connected to interpretability. So if you read papers, if you uh, read blog posts, watch YouTube videos, uh, there are so many terms and I was thinking, let's say two minutes about it, and I collected all the terms which came to my mind, which somehow uh, tells you, or which are somehow connected to interpretability. So for example, you have contribution, you have impact, pixel attribution, relevance, saliency, and so on. They are much, much more to think about it uh, more. But what I want to, uh, to tell you with this, um, with this word cloud is that um, you need to be careful what is meant and what you want to have. Do you want to have sensitivity or do you want to have a contribution? Um, because it, depending on this, the explanation might change. To give you one example, sensitivity will tell you what will happen with the output if you slightly change your input. The contribution um, is uh, the actual quantification of how much a specific pattern influenced the result. So this is different and it's a little bit similar to the mean and the standard deviation. It, the one thing tells you about the variance and the other about uh, an average. Uh, so 
What I want to say is be careful and think before applying an interpretation to what you really want to have. Okay, so the first uh, part I want to cover here in this lecture, in this lecture series, is in uh, inherently interpretable models. And I will specifically talk about linear regression and decision trees. And now you might think so, oh, okay, they're, they're a little bit boring. Uh, so yeah, but um, what I want to show you is if you, there are inherently interpretable models. And so it's sometimes really cool to design models where you have uh, immediately an interpretation and I will show you exactly how you can interpret uh, all the parts in a linear model and decision tree and then feel free to try it with, uh, with other models. Of course it's also possible with other models. But first of all I want to introduce my notation so that uh, when I show you equations you know what I mean and I will use this notation throughout all lectures. Uh, maybe you already watched some other lectures uh, from from me, so I uh, yeah I always try to stick to exactly this notation. So what we have is so we have given feature vectors here phi uh, n is the number uh, the total number of um, features uh, uh, feature vectors that means uh, samples, and of course a feature vector can be uh, multidimensional, and uh, the dimension i. Uh, denote with D and then we have some target uh, response outputs which are uh, denoted with Y and the goal is to predict the output given new input. So this is the goal of uh, a machine learning model and the machine learning model is actually F. So this is your uh, regression model or classification model, whatever you want to have. T uh, means it's a test sample and W are the parameters and tilde means always that this is something what is estimated. And a very common approach to learn um, um, uh, a classification model or a regression model is supervised learning. So in the setting, what you have is you have pairs of feature vectors and labels. Uh, you have exactly n of these pairs. And so typical input, uh, input features in the context of plant science are, are, for example, the plant height or just an image with spectral information. So it can be super diverse. And target outputs can be the class of what is on the field or as plant, plant species. And in this case, we speak about classification. Uh, or it can be a continuous output, um, such as the biomass or the leaf area. And here we speak of regression. I, I guess you all know it, but just that uh, we are on the same page here. So another learning paradigm is uh, unsupervised learning, really cool uh, area. Uh, so here you want to find patterns in the data um, or you want to find specific groups as here, for example, you have two clusters. Um, and in this case, you do not have access to uh, your labels. You just have access to your data. So, um, which can sometimes be enough to find, uh, to search for patterns in the data. Um, yeah, so these are the most commonly used, uh, but of course there are also other learning paradigms. It's just that I want to uh, briefly men uh, want to mention these two here. So let's have a look at how we can learn a linear regression model. Um, if you know it and it's too boring, just skip the next uh, few minutes and afterwards I will tell you how exactly we can come up with a lot of interpretations here. So what you have is you have given your observation collected in feature vectors phi and you have your labels y here, this is your output, your response and the blue points here are your actual observations and in our case they are one dimensional. What we want to derive is a regression model indicated by F there. So this is our regression model. And F depends on the feature vectors and the parameters W. And W consists of a bias term, which is the intercept. And uh, then we have weights uh, WD, which define the direction or the, the slope of the regression line. And D is the dimension uh, of the feature vectors, which is in our case one dimensional. 
and you find the relationship of your input to your output and in our case it's a linear re relationship and as I said before of course you can um, uh, you can have a nonlinear relationship, but then be careful what I tell you later with the interpretation. This might change. Um, okay, so uh, so what we can we actually interpret? Uh, so what we can do is we can have a look at the coefficients or the weights and the intercept. Uh, then we can have a look at the feature importance and the feature effect. And, uh, I will tell you exactly why this feature effect is uh, really cool and why it sometimes is better to have a look at the feature effect and not at the feature importance. But first of all, uh, let's have a look at the interpretation of um, weights and coefficients in uh, a linear regression model. And here it depends on the type of the corresponding feature. So for example, if you have a numerical feature or a binary feature or a categorical feature. If I do not say something specifically in the rest of all the lectures, um, I mean, uh, I always speak about numerical features, but here I want to mention also the binary features. So, um, yeah, so first of all, interpretation only in combination with the features. And uh, because the intercept uh, does not have uh, a feature, the intercept is interpreted with the feature phi 0 equals 1. So here you just uh, have a constant feature, which is uh, 1 for all samples. So let's have a look at what the weights tell us. Um, so when we so let's have first look at the numerical feature. So when we increase the numerical feature phi, di, uh, phi, phi d by one unit, that means that delta phi, uh, um, phi d is one here. This is actually one, uh, one unit. Then the estimated uh, outcome y tilde is changed exactly by the value of, this, uh, of the specific weight uh, wd. Um, so this is, so what does it tell you? So when you um, change, um, uh, yeah, when you change the feature by exactly one unit, so you immediately see, okay, this will, uh, then the outcome will change exactly by the value of, uh, of the weight. So this is uh, quite easy to uh, understand. And this is uh, very similar to binary features. So uh, when we increase a binary feature um, phi d by one unit, that means uh, delta phi d is one which is equal to changing from one category to another category, this changes the estimated outcome by the feature's weight. So here you actually think about, um, so it's, it's, it's very similar, but very um, a bit different. So here you change actually, actually the category and here you change um, yeah, this uh, continuous feature by one unit. And this is also similar to categorical features. I did not mention it uh, here explicitly because uh, it's uh, similar to the binary features. And here the interpretation for each category is uh, then the same as the interpretation for the binary, feature, binary features, but it depends on how you represent the categories. But there's this uh, famous uh, one hot encoding. And if you use this, it will lead to the same procedure um, for the interpretation. Okay, um, so this is, this is actually quite nice because you have this uh, linearity, so you immediately know, okay, change by one unit is exactly changed by uh, the value of the weight. But let's come uh, to the intercept. So, as I said, again, uh, the intercept has actually no assigned features, but here I added this uh, phi zero for simplicity. Uh, phi zero uh, can, be, uh, can be one, so it's a, a constant feature, which is always one for all samples. And for simplicity, let's assume we have only numerical features. And the interpretation is then the following. 
For example, with all numerical feature values at zero, uh, the model prediction is the intercept weight. So what is happening when the feature uh, here, when this, uh, these features are zero, this whole part gets zero and then only this part um, stays and this is then exactly the intercept because phi zero is one. Um, but um, let's first think about it when this will happen because usually such an interpretation is not relevant because instance with all feature values as zero often makes no sense. Um, but there is a case when it makes sense. Uh, the interpretation is meaningful when the features have, uh, have been standardized. That means uh, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And then the intercept reflects the predicted outcome of an instance where all features are at their mean value. So if you standardize and you have a mean of zero and uh, all, so this term becomes zero when all features are at uh, zero, then this is exactly uh, how you can derive an interpretation of the intercept. And so let's talk about uh, more about, or not more, but let's go away from this uh, weight and coefficient interpretation and let's come to the feature importance. Um, so when you think about it, the first thought is, okay, um, the weight might say something, um, and if you think about it more, you will also realize that the variance of the weight is important. So it's not only about the value, it's also about uh, the weight because the, um, uh, it's about the, the, the variance. So uh, if, you have, uh, um, if you have a high value or if you have a high value for a weight, um, but if you change, for example, uh, if you re-estimate the model and uh, the weight would change a lot, so the variance is, uh, might be even higher than the actual uh, weight value, it will not tell you a lot. So it's always good to have not only a look at the uh, value of the weight, but also the variance. And when I talk about variance, um, let's be a little bit more specific. Um, so we need to have a look at the t-statistic. Um, so the, uh, the t-statistic is the estimated weight scaled with the standard error. Um, and now you might think, uh, okay, so what is the standard error? Good question, um, because it's not the standard deviation. There is a difference, but it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's connected. Um, or not, not really connected, but there, there is a connection. So let's make a brief digression. Uh, so what is the standard error? The standard error tells you of how much sampling variation there is if we sample or measure again and again and then uh, re-estimate the weight. So when, we, when you deal with uh, measurements with scientific data, you uh, can re-estimate the data and because you have uh, very often used sensors um, you have a variation in what is measured. And if you use the data and re-estimate the weight, it changes. And this is the standard error. In contrast, the standard deviation tells you something about the variability, variability of the samples. So the standard deviation is about the data and the standard error is what results from it. But there's another issue um, so thinking about the, the feature importance and that you need to also have a look at the variance, there's another issue, which is that the value of the weight depends on the range of the features. So this is what I, what I meant with, uh, there's not really a good uh, a point in only looking at the weights so independent of the features. Um, so that means when you have features with different range, the values of the weight are actually not comparable. So you get some values, but it's not really comparable. So therefore, instead uh, of looking only at the value of, of the weights and the variance, uh, we look at the weight feature combination and how they contribute to the, contribute to the actual outcome. 
And this is the, the so-called effect. So effect is the contribution of the weight feature combination. And what you do is you, uh, yeah, you do not only look at um, this WD, but just um, yeah, the combination, it means you multiply them. And this is the effect. And this can be performed for one feature or for the whole uh, data set. And here you can see schematically uh, such a weight plot and an effect plot. So this is uh, just a visualization about um, when you have a larger data set, a linear model, and you want to visualize what is the uh, importance or the effect of the weight. So what the, do the weights actually tell you about uh, the data set? Um, so the weight values can be il illustrated uh, there here, so, and they can be illustrated with confidence intervals. Uh, for example, a 95 uh, confidence interval, and this is exactly the standard error. Again, it's, so what, what, is, what can be seen here is the standard error. So if you change the data set, if you have variability in the data set, it's the, um, it's the variability of the, of the weight here, the standard error. So, what you see in this plot is if your weight has a negative effect or positive influence on the outcome, but you cannot really get an impression uh, about the contribution and they are hard to compare because of the maybe different ranges of the features. However, of course, you can standardize or you can normalize your data so uh, you can make that um, then the weights might be, uh, or they are comparable then, uh, when you scale the features to zero mean and standard deviation uh, of one. But sometimes you do not want to do it for several reasons. And then you should uh, not go for this, but you should have a look at the effect plot because this uh, effect plot can account for this. The effects can be visualized, for example, with box plots. And here you can see, as the name says, uh, such boxes. And this box uh, is, uh, contains the effect range for half of the data from 25% to 75% effect quantiles. Um, and then you have a vertical line in this box. This is actually the median effect. So, uh, 50% of the date uh, uh, have a 50% of the effects have a lower, um, and the other, uh, other half have a higher effect on the on the prediction. And then you have uh, horizontal lines here, two for each, uh, or it's sometimes it's only one, but not not more than two, uh, left and right of the box. They are called lower and upper whiskers. And they indicate the range of the effects, um, which are no outliers. So, of course, you need to decide when an effect is an outlier. But uh, here you just define uh, a threshold. And um, yeah, these whiskers indicate uh, where, uh, to which point uh, there are no outliers. And if there are no outliers, the whiskers will extend to the minimum and maximum range uh, of the effect values. So this is uh, what you can see here is it's now you can really compare the effects uh, in comparison to here. And yeah, actually quite nice to learn something uh, about your data and how important uh, a specific feature or more specifically feature dimension is for the actual outcome. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? It's, first of all, it's easy to understand and analyze because yeah, it's linear regression. We have uh, linear regression is well understood. It's common. There are common tools for interpretation and there, but because it's a linear relationship, uh, this is, yeah, it's a strong assumption. And so due to this linearity, uh, sometimes the predictive performance is low. It's not always the case, but it, um, yeah, if I always say um, 
if you have a linear relationship between the input and the output, there's no reason not to use a linear model. There's no reason to use a, a neural network. But if there is a complex relationship, a nonlinear relationship, you uh, might not get happy with uh, a linear model and this might even lead to, uh, uh, yeah, to wrong, uh, wrong results, wrong interpretations. And the problem are correlated features which might lead to unintuitive interpretations. And in the last few minutes, slides, I uh, will tell you something about land cover classification because here um, this is a, a super cool use case to, for decision trees. And so what you can see here is a uh, satellite image from a place called Rheinauer in Bonn, where I live, really nice place. And what you can see here is the illustration in pseudocolor. Pseudocolor means uh, you do not have this red, green, blue. Um, but you, uh, what you illustrate is near infrared, uh, red and green. And the reason why all this vegetation appears red in this image um, is because uh, the uh, so vegetation has a very high uh, near infrared value. And if you illustrate it, or if you visualize it, plot it in the red channel, you get a yeah, high red value. Uh, so this is just a little bit to, to give you some remote sensing uh, knowledge uh, uh, within this explainable machine learning lecture. And on the right uh, illustrated is a feature space uh, which um, belongs actually to this uh, satellite image. Uh, what is illustrated is near infrared and red and for simplicity we only look at these two features in the next few slides. And again, what you can see here is, yes, the vegetation has a high near infrared value. And, and now you want to define a classifier, but you also want to analyze what is actually happening in the decision process and what features are important. And so let's briefly repeat what decision trees uh, actually do and how they look like. Again, if you are super familiar with decision trees, you can just uh, skip or fast forward and uh, just listen to how you can uh, interpret a decision tree. But for who of you who want uh, to get a brief um, uh, repetition, um, a brief summary of what decision trees do, um, here it is. So what decision trees do is they define rules. That means they define thresholds in the feature space. And if you do this in a hierarchy, you get uh, such a decision tree. So this is the feature space with all the, uh, the threshold in the feature space. And this is the uh, decision tree uh, actually illustrating exactly the same. And so let's go through it. What you have is you have a root node, which is uh, that's the start. Then you have decision nodes with test function where you actually test, um, you, uh, you define a threshold and then you say if it's larger as the threshold and then you say yes or no. So you have a decision and then you have leaf nodes and leaf nodes are the end of the sequence and here you have a class when you, when you use it for classification. And um, so each decision node implements a test function with a discrete outcome. And the test function of each decision node splits the input space into regions RL. And this RL we actually need uh, later for the equations. So this is uh, one region in the feature space. And this one region contains uh, yeah, samples, which actually at the current status of the decision tree fall into uh, this region. And then you have leaf nodes, as I said before, and they symbolize the end of a sequence of the decision and the single output class is associated to each leaf node. Here illustrated we have one leaf node for one class, but of course you can have more than uh, these leaf nodes. So for example, you can have several leaf nodes for water and for vegetation and so on. 
And the leaf node defines a localized region in the input space where samples falling in this region have the same label. And when this is the case, you speak of a pure region. So have a pure node, a pure region. And so let's assume you have a given decision tree. And so what you do is you start at, uh, uh, at the root node and then you, um, in order to make a decision, you first have a look if the current node is leaf node and is yes, return the class label. If not, um, perform the test of the current decision node and follow this uh, corresponding branch. And then you go back to two and so on. So now what, what we can interpret? First of all, we can analyze the whole decision process, which is super easy for a decision tree. Um, you can also do it for random forest because you can formulate each path in the decision tree as a chain of decisions. If it's useful when the decision tree is very complex or if, when you have a random forest is questionable, but actually it's, it's possible. So what you do is you, you can formulate if a specific feature is larger or for a specific sample, if the feature, a specific feature is larger than T1, uh, and if uh, this other specific feature is larger than D2, and so on and so on. You just formulate your decisions as, as language. So that's easy, but then, um, there's feature importance and the contribution to an actual uh, individual prediction. So the feature importance is uh, here you calculate how much each feature contributes to the overall model performance. And then again, you have um, uh, the possibility not to look at the whole model, but this, at the specific um, uh, prediction. And here you determine how much each feature contributed to a single prediction. And in order to have a look at um, this feature importance and the contribution uh, to a single prediction, we need to understand how these splits are done. And the famous procedure is to compute the purity of a node. And the purity is a measure of the homogeneity with respect to the class labels. And what you can see here is actually one uh, part uh, of a decision tree, one um, yeah, one, one split, what you do, um, here is one split made based on a threshold T1 and the feature, uh, the, the red channel. And uh, what you want to do is you want to minimize the impurity or maximize the purity. Um, and this is used to find splits in a tree. And the purer in, uh, the node, the better was the previous split. So if all classes are mixed up, the node is impure. Uh, if only one class is present, uh, it's maximally pure. So here the classes are still uh, mixed up, so the, uh, you do not have pure nodes. And one possibility to measure the purity is the entropy. And the, uh, the equations to compute the entropy are given here. To compute the entropy, uh, you use the probability that the sample is, a client, uh, is assigned to class uh, K. So you have here the index K and uh, P is the probability. And for example, if uh, in a region L, 20% of the training data of class one is still assigned incorrectly to, uh, to other classes, then you compute here 0.8 times logarithm um, uh, of 0 0.8. And this is summed over all classes, and then you take the negative value. And this equation here is, um, is actually the formal way to do it, what I just said, uh, to compute the probability. So what you have here is you have a class labeled CN, so you have, uh, you have N, samples, but you only have a look at uh, the samples which are currently in a region RL. And what you compare here is I is the indicator function, and the indicator function is uh, zero if CN 
uh, is not equal to k and if it's one if cn the label of point n is uh, is k and then uh, yeah you normalize it so you just uh, count how many samples are in the region um, okay and then the overall importance of a feature in the decision tree uh, can be computed in the following way. So what you do is you go through all splits in, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the whole decision trees. And, uh, but yeah, you do, no, you do not actually go through all splits, but you go uh, through the whole decision tree and you have a look where the specific feature uh, D was used and you measure how much it has reduced the impurity compared to the parent node. And uh, so the parent node is here given on the top and these are the children. And uh, so HL here, HL is uh, the impurity of the parent node. And then these two terms here in the brackets are uh, a weighted sum of the impurity, that means the entropy, of the left and the right node. So you have the, uh, the left node, the right node, and these are actually the uh, two, two weights which involve uh, yeah, how many points are now in the, in the children nodes. Uh, yeah, so um, so the, uh, what you do is uh, you sum over all this delta HL then, which was computed here, that include a specific feature. And that means that each importance of, uh, or that each importance of each feature can be interpreted as a share of the overall model importance. And this can be arrived by uh, by summing over all features uh, when they are scaled uh, to 100 or scaled to 1 to make them, um, yeah, or to, to get a good impression how much actually is feature, each feature is contributing to the overall performance. Okay, um, good. Let's have a look at the, the last thing, which is the contribution of a, to a single um, um, prediction. Uh, it's uh, yeah. It's actually the the title should be contribution to a single prediction. <laughs> so how much do, does each feature contribute to one single uh, outcome? So in a similar way, the contribution uh, to a single prediction can be computed. Um, and but what you need here is the actual decision path. So you do not look at the whole uh, decision tree, but you look at the um, decision path for a single prediction. And this path is here schematically uh, illustrated in red. Uh, so we track a decision through the, whole, uh, through the whole tree and interpret the prediction by the contribution added at each decision node. So um, if we go through this uh, decision path here, this red one, we do a feature-wise calculation by summing up the contribution of each feature from the root to the leaf node. The contribution can be computed again with the, with the impurity, that means with the entropy, but also other kinds of uh, measures uh, are possible. So, okay, so again, so on the one side, you had the feature, uh, feature importance to the whole decision tree and here only to one single prediction. Um, what are now the advantages and disadvantages? Uh, so first of all, decision trees can model nonlinear relationships. So in this respect, they are better than linear models, but they are very inefficient with linear relationships because uh, trees fail to deal with linear relationships. Uh, because any linear relationship uh, between an input and an output uh, has to be approximated by all these splits. So this is super inefficient. Um, and, uh, but otherwise they're really good. And they create easy to understand human friendly interpretations. So uh, that's actually a good thing. 
So because you can just formulate it, you go through the decision path and you can formulate it as uh, with languages, as, as sentences. Um, but due to the splits, uh, small changes in the input can cause abrupt changes in the outcome. And also small changes in the data set can cause big changes in the tree architecture. So it's not that you have one unique decision tree for one setup, for one data set. It's more that you can have uh, very, um, a lot of different decision trees. To conclude, uh, so what I told you were uh, inherently interpretable models. Uh, there, it always seems a nice idea that you, um, that you have, uh, that the interpretation comes immediately with the optimization, but these models are only easy to interpret as long as they are small. If you have a super big random forest, which is a combination of decision trees, it, uh, it's, it's not, um, yeah, the interpretation might not really help you. And uh, then it's again, uh, also the interpretation is very complex. Then a high interpretability usually comes at the expense of a predictive performance. And I say here usually because it's not always like this. But if you do specifically design a model to be interpretable, the, the chance is high that you need to give away a little bit of this predictive performance. And, but the good thing is that no additional tools are necessary. So you do not need this post hoc analysis and you, it's not uh, that the interpretation and the model learning is independent, which is also good uh, and so on. Okay, my takeaway uh, for you for today for this lecture is explainable machine learning is not new, especially when you look at uh, decision trees, random forest, this feature importance is, is nothing which was invented in the last years. It was uh, always there since random forests are there and since uh, decision trees were there. Um, uh, it's just that explainable machine learning got new um, new power or new, new uh, interest because there were uh, neural networks, they were powerful, they were complex and so there is a demand and then a lot of methods were developed uh, who, that can interpret deep neural networks. So it's, it was just the whole research uh, area grew bigger. Explainable machine learning offers a lot of methods which need to be chosen carefully based on your analysis goal. That's also important. And it's connected to uncertainty quantification. I already mentioned uh, confidence intervals, several times variance, standard error, and so on. There's a huge overlap between this uh, research area of uncertainty quantification and um, explainable machine learning. Super interesting where they overlap. And it, uh, one good thing is that explainable machine learning goes beyond explaining models which are aligned with our given knowledge. So uh, this is what I meant with we can use it to discover new things. So if we analyze the decision process and it or the model might even be better than a human. So we can learn from the model. We can learn from um, these visualizations, from uh, the insights we get from this analysis of these decision processes and analysis of the data. But we need the main experts. Otherwise, you only have interpretations and no explanations. And um, as further, further literature, so I always uh, have these uh, references in the bottom of the slide. So every time when I use something from uh, a paper or from a blog, I, um, I indicate it. And there's one book um, uh, where you can have a look at. So there are further informations. Uh, I will mention a few further um, recommendations for reading in the next lectures and of course I thank my PhD student Ahmed who helped me a lot with the lecture and who will help me even more with the next lectures. So thanks again uh, for your attention and hope to see you in the next lecture.